Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our Master of Ceremony. He reported the news from Kosovo, the Middle East, and Afghanistan. From 2005 till 2007, he was our principal Dutch correspondent in the United States. And during the Arab Spring, he reported live from Egypt. A frequently seen face on television and an adventurous journalist, we are delighted to have him here. Give him a warm welcome, Wouter Kurpersoek. Well, that's quite a welcome. No cameras today, so it feels a little bit different. Uh, thank you, Joost. I feel uh, honored to be your master of ceremony today, and it almost feels like hosting the real United Nations. And just for us, also for the speakers who are present here today, to get a short impression. Who's been on an airplane for more than 12 hours to get here? And shout out where you're from. Australia, yeah. India, yeah. Thailand, yeah. Egypt. Yeah. Okay, this is, this is probably what it sounds like in the translation rooms of the EU and the United Nations, all these different. Anyway, as I am allowed to say in my American English, I feel honored again to be here. Um, and for me, as a reporter, uh, I've covered many events that involve NATO, the EU, United Nations, and so on, and so on. I've always been covering the people on the ground, though, the people who do the work and do the work on behalf of all these policymakers and all the politicians who create policies. And whether it's in Bosnia or in the Middle East or now in Syria, where a big uh, decisions need to be made. It's always for me extremely impressive to see these people on the ground at work. Therefore, I've developed also a great interest for people who make decisions. And for example, the people uh, who are here today who will speak, who have to tell the politicians what to decide, guide them in making the right decisions. And what we see often today is that there is a big difference on what is being decided in Moscow, Washington, Brussels, and what the people on the ground see of that. So today we will discuss that. Is there a place in the world for NATO, for United Nations, for the EU, and what, we, what, what, what does it do to us, you know, just normal citizens of the world? Um, we have a few very, very interesting uh, speakers uh, today. Uh, of course, we have Mr. Joseph Menzo, who is the Chief of Mission of the United States to NATO. I will introduce him later, of course. We have uh, Mr. de Gooyer. He is the permanent representative of the Netherlands to the European Union and also, also a very distinguished uh, diplomat. And of course, we have a real princess here today, Princess Laurentine. And uh, with her very impressive international CV, she is definitely more than a princess who lives in a palace. I don't think we do that anymore in our country. Uh, and she is definitely also not disconnected from the world around her. So we're really proud to have you here. We're here in the most international city of the Netherlands, maybe the most international city in the world because of so many international institutions that are here in The Hague. And of course, we are really proud that the mayor of The Hague, Mr. Van Aerts, is here to welcome all of you here in his city. And Mr. Van Aerts, if I may please ask you to come on stage. Mr. Van Aerts is a foreign minister, a former foreign minister, so also As a former foreign minister, you're, of course, you feel uh, like a fish in the water here with all these international people. Okay, maybe not. Koninklijke Hoogheid, Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, dear students from all over the world, as we uh, now know, traveled so long. Welcome uh, to the city of uh, The Hague. The city uh, which once again has the uh, honor hosting the annual conference of the European International Model United Nations. We are uh, today meeting in one of the oldest uh, theaters in uh, The Hague. Over 200 years ago, this building, originally dating from the 16th century, was home to the Society of Physics, Diligentia. However, anyone 
who thinks that um, this has since, the, since then only been a venue for lectures, demonstrations relating to physics, would be wrong. Totally reflecting uh, Beethoven's claim that music is a higher revelation than all wisdom and philosophy, it soon started organizing concerts too. And it attracted some famous names. In 1853, Robert Schumann conducted his piano concerto, concerto featuring his wife Clara as soloist. And 12 years later, the world premiere of the famous Toten Dance or Danse Macabre by Franz Liszt was held here. And when writing the piece, Liszt had drawn inspiration from the fresco in the Camposanto Monumentale of Pisa, Il Triunfo della Morte, The Triumph of Death. And um, the title of that uh, famous painting brings me to the theme of your conference this year, preserving the future, overcoming the paradox of power. Because despite the progress we've made in international cooperation, the sad fact is that the global community still doesn't always manage to intervene effectively in humanitarian crisis. The situation in Syria is a harrowing example of that inability. And in the meantime, sense and justice are not triumphing in Syria, but violence and death. And the world may not rest until this changes. It's the ambivalence embedded in the United Nations Charter between the principles of sovereignty on the one hand and the desire to protect human rights on the other, which so often robbed the United Nations of its decisiveness. Now it's understandable for anyone with a grasp of history why human rights initially lost out so often to the principle of sovereignty. Since the peace of Westphalia, it forms the basis of our international system. For example, in his book, Perpetual Peace from 1795, Immanuel Kant made a strong case for respecting the right of non-intervention because that afforded the necessary territorial space and political independence in which free and equal citizens could work out their own way of life and what their own way of life would be. The protection of human rights was only generally recognized much later with the appearance of the Genocide Convention and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, both in 1948. However, the debate about humanitarian intervention continued for much longer. John Stuart Mill, he already wrote about it in the middle of the 19th century in his essay, A Few Words on Non-Intervention. Although he was very much in favor of non-intervention, John Stuart Mill argued that there are several good reasons to intervene. Some civil wars, for example, become, as he wrote, so protracted that a common sense of sympathy for the suffering of the non-combatant population calls for outside, outside intervention to hold the fighting in order to see whether some negotiated solution might be achieved under the aegis of foreign arms. A very modern way of thinking, in fact. After the end of the Cold War and the following bitter experiences with the war in former Yugoslavia and the bloodbath in Rwanda, the lobby for humanitarian intervention grew in strength. The term sovereignty lost its absolute status and is now interpreted in the original sense, namely that one state is not subordinate to another and does not, does not interpret it as the complete freedom of states to act as they will on their own soil, even if such action is contrary to international treaties. The Netherlands has actively work towards substantiating the term humanitarian intervention in, on the international stage. 
Around the turn of this century, it organized three international conferences at which the guidelines for the decision-making surrounding in humanitarian interventions were drawn up, whereby the statute of the International Criminal Court was also invoked. The statute determines that crimes against humanity are by definition a threat to peace and security in the world. At the instigation of Canada, the International Commission on Humanitarian Intervention and State Sovereignty was set up. And this commission builds, in fact, on the word work of the mentioned conferences and on Francis Deng's principle of sovereignty as a responsibility. This principle would ultimately lay the foundations for the groundbreaking UN document R2P, the responsibility to protect. Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, the Dutch constitution obliges us, our country and us, to reinforce the international rule of law. The Hague has the honor of making an important contribution. We are home to the highest legal body of the United Nations, the International, international Court of Justice. And its seat is the Peace Palace, the icon of The Hague as an international city of peace and justice. And this summer, on the 28th of uh, August uh, this year, to be precise, we are celebrating the centenary of the Peace Palace. And three months ago, we had the privilege of attending the start of the construction of a building which has sometimes been referred to as the Peace Palace of the 21st century, the International Criminal Court. The Criminal Court might be the best thing that the international community has achieved in years. Finally, we, the world, we have a permanent institution which can call to account anyone who violates human rights. Through its foundation, a dream became a possible reality. The reality of a world in which war criminals do not go unpunished and in which their victims are given a voice. A world in which people can live without fear, as articulated by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt more than 70 years ago in his famous Four Freedoms speech. Notwithstanding the deterrent and thus the preventive effect of the criminal court, preventing crimes against humanity must be obviously always have top priority. With responsibility to protect, the first step has been taken, but a follow-up must come soon, or responsibility to protect will remain a paper tiger. We have to think, to speak, and to act. And that's why we in the city of uh, The Hague are so, placed, so pleased that you, uh, students from all over the world, be, be, will be focusing on subjects like these in the coming days. This is really about preserving the future, a just and peaceful future. And The Hague is delighted to provide a platform for this. Thank you very much.